Well, on this episode of MSU Today, a progress report on the implementation of the faculty and staff's theme of the MSU 2030 Strategic Plan, with a particular emphasis today on the faculty. And we're going to do that with Teresa Maston of the Provost's Office. And here to talk with Teresa is Bill Beekman, our Vice President for Strategic Initiatives. Bill, take it away. Well, thanks so much, Russ. We're really excited to have our uh, Vice Provost and Associate Vice President for Faculty and Academic Staff Affairs, and that is a mouthful. Uh, Teresa Maston here with us today. Teresa, let's start out by just asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your career path. What brought you to this really interesting role? I think that you know, probably no, but nobody at seven or ten years old woke up in the morning and said, I want to be a Vice Provost. Um, but uh, but here you are in this really critically important role for Michigan State. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you here. Thank you, Bill. Well, I, I think a good way to start before I start telling a little bit about myself is that I think most people don't know what a provost is, what a vice provost is. So to start that out, think about it as the academic side of the house, so to speak. So people know the president, they know the business part, but the academic part is a different animal, so to speak. And so let me start with that. But to tell you a little bit about me and why this job, I'm sure when I was six, seven, or eight, I had no idea that it existed. Um, I actually grew up in the Deep South, if you call Tennessee the Deep South. I don't even know that I knew that universities existed. Um, I, I was the first kid in my family to go to an integrated school. I know people think that was yesteryear, but I was born in 1960. My oldest brother was born in 1955. Brown Bo uh, versus Board of Education was 1954, and yet it was 1960. So if I was born in 60, what, I probably went to school 65, 66. That was when it actually happened in Tennessee. Um, so, but Michigan State, why here and why the vice provost? So I've been at Michigan State three times in my life, and I feel that I owe Michigan State a great deal, and I'm a big, big fan of paying it forward. So I came first at the ripe old age of 34 to work on a PhD, and that was in 1994. So 1994 to 1998, I was here. Um, earned a PhD, came back on the faculty for five years. There seems to be this four or five year thing. Um, came back on the faculty in the College of Communication Arts and Sciences and Advertising and Public Relations from 2003 to 2008. Left, uh, then came back as the chair of Advertising and Public Relations in 2018. So that was my third uh, entree. Love being chair. Um, I think like every job in the world, they're complicated, but I think especially now, being in academic leadership is a really challenging job. And that's why um, FAFSA or faculty and academic staff affairs are really important. So why the vice provost for me, um, Terry Curry, who was the vice provost, I don't know, these titles change all the time. And I saw him as a person who could get consensus, but not consensus for a consensus sake. Um, he did a great job of helping everybody understand it's really that compromise, living in that middle ground that we work best. How can we do that? And so when Terry decided to leave and the position became open, um, I talked with a couple of people and thought, you know, is this some way that I can give back? Especially as, you know, being here three different times, having this experience from industry before I came back from the PhD, and then now, especially li living in the concept, the mindset that it's so important to give back. And everything that you've been given Everything that you have the opportunity for is your responsibility to make that possible. So, for example, going back to my childhood, um, it's a miracle that I was actually able to go to university at all. And the fact that I've earned a PhD is essentially a miracle, but it also means that I need to do everything that I can to help people have that experience as well, if they want it. Um, I think if you look like 
my mom was one of 14, my dad was one of 13. And I have five brothers and two sisters, so there were eight kids. And so I was fortunate. I, I'm really into birth order. I think had I been the oldest daughter, my life would have been different. Had I not been the fourth child, my life would have been different. But what I think about sometimes now, if there's someone, it doesn't have to be in a small farming community. I grew up in a small farming community. Whatever the environment is, are we creating spaces, creating educational opportunities so everyone has access? I think everyone uh, works really hard. I think there's a lot of luck. And so what do we actually do to make that happen? So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's really important in that way. So what does that mean for me as the vice provost? If you think about it in the context of life cycle, it's so important that um did either did you actually watch the waltons yes, no. so what i loved about the waltons um the whole family lived in the same house obviously it was idyllic on the show i'm sure it wasn't that s smooth at all times but if the parents were going through something the children could reach out to the grandparents it was always someone there if you think about it in the concept it takes a child to raise a village so if you think about the concept that it takes a child to raise a village how do you set up a system so that there is always somebody there for faculty and academic staff and that's one of the things that we do uh, we try to make sure so there's myself assistant provosts and directors the directors are assigned to various colleges and what's critically important in those colleges that they have a really really great working relationship with the dean the chairs and people know who we are and that they can come to us I think people think of our branch in the provost office is punitive. We're trying really, really hard to be proactive, but as some of the challenges that we faced recently at MSU, it's like we're on the defensive. We're trying to get things done, and so we're working really hard to do that. One of the things that we're gonna, we're trying to do, um, I naively thought we could do this in the spring, so I started January 1, was to go on a road show. And I asked all of the deans to provide us with the opportunity to come to the colleges, uh, ideally to all college meeting. I'm my um, background is communication, and I think every faculty, every faculty member, every employee at MSU is an ambassador. And you can't truly be a great ambassador if you don't have a holistic understanding of what the organization does why it's there and how you fit into it. So if we go on a road show um, and they allow us to go to an all college where absolutely everybody in the college is there to help them to understand why we're here, what we do, that they can absolutely reach out to us and the importance of everybody understanding the holistic picture as much as possible so that you know we can make a difference. So if you think about... Um, the concept of it takes a village. I also love, love, love the Native American concept of seven generations. Like if you make a decision today, uh, long-term thinking as opposed to short-term thinking, yes, we know how it would impact you, but how will it impact the people seven generations from now? And that's really, really, really important um, to, to do because otherwise I think we see things differently um, and we're more responsible in that way. So that's really what we're trying to do. But of course, our primary role in that is to, pr to pr protect, to um, promote and um, the provost. So the provost is clearly the public face right of the office the things that we do behind the scene what is it the faculty really care about they care about representation they care about being heard they care about transparency so we should know what those bylaws are if someone comes to me and say hey i want you to make this decision that's going to impact me individually obviously that's not the way the question is but i have to say and i you know this is my mantra we have a process and that process is for everyone. We want to follow that process. Now, there's a time and a place to change the process, and we want to do that. But until that happens, we're going to follow the process. 
And that's more difficult to do than you would imagine because I think people in education in general are compassionate and you want to make sure that people can be successful. And if you think about, you know, our families and everything, you know that some family members struggle more than others and it takes some family members a longer time to get things together and you want to do that. And so we run into this tricky space sometimes where we... um, We want to say that we're a family, but we don't really fire family, right? And when family runs into issues, we work with them uh, and help them get there. It doesn't quite translate to that in an organization, primarily because when you're responsible for doing something, if you don't do that, you're impacting so many other people, right? So it's not exactly the same as everybody can rally around the family member and kind of like, okay, today is your day to make sure they're whatever. Um, So we we get into trouble when we do that, but you also can see how layered and complex things are, right? So you see someone struggling, but you know them, you're a faculty member with them, you know their kids, you know all of these sorts of things, but everybody out there don't see that. And one of the issues that we run into everywhere, especially at universities, is the privacy concept. Um, One of the things that make being a chair, that makes being a dean so difficult, um, I used to think about this as a chair at a faculty meeting. I'm looking out at the faculty, say it's like 50 people in the room, and I know all of these different things that people are going through. Um, I, I think it's something in human nature that we like center ourselves. And I think, okay, if I say this, this person's going to be offended. If I say this, this person's going to think I'm not supporting them. But if I don't explain why we didn't address this issue, it's a privacy issue, which they would understand if they were involved. So more than anything, it is trying even though this doesn't translate that well, creating a family environment so that as much as possible people know one another, they give one another the benefit of the doubt. Uh, But that has to happen at the grass level, right? The grassroots level and build up. So essentially what I like to do in this role is to see how can we create that, you know, at such a massive, massive level. So I know that's going on and on and it's whatever, but at the end of the day, that's why I'm interested in this role. Can, um, you know, I always tell my students, and that's why I miss the classroom, by the way. I tell my students, I'm like, look, you, I don't want you, and this is usually in a communication context before we go into world issues and differences between different groups. I, you know, from a communication perspective, I don't want you to see the world the way I do. However, if you're developing a campaign where you need me to do something, you cannot develop that campaign and have me to comply if you don't know who I am. And as communication students, it's your responsibility to know this. And so that's essentially in a long drawn out answer why um, I applied for the position and why I'm excited about being the vice provost. Cool. Well, you covered a couple really uh, sort of wonderful things. Your, you know, your, your life story really speaks to uh, so much of what Michigan State University is about, the, the intersection of possibility and excellence, and um, something that, that certainly is, is very meaningful t- to me as well. Uh, when you talk about the the family of the university and and I appreciate the in some aspects the clunkiness but but that is a very very apt analogy um, you know, like families uh, it's a very complex environment um, and there are uh, many different uh, uh, aspects cultures within this this complex world we live in but in your role working uh, largely with uh, with our faculty and academic staff, uh, you have uh, sort of, for lack of a better word, different categories of people. Um, you have uh, the tenured faculty and tenure system faculty. Uh, we have uh, fixed term uh, faculty. We have a health promotions track. Uh, we have academic specialists and librarians are in their own unique category. And yet all these people sort of come together in uh, as sort of 
different threads of a fabric that really hold the place together and, uh, and, and make things work. Many, uh, many people may not appreciate some of those distinctions. So could you share with us what it, what it means to be a, a faculty in the tenure track versus uh, a, 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 a fixed term or, or health professions kind of track faculty member? Yeah, I really, really appreciate that question. Um, I think it's important to talk about, and I think it's something we as the university must talk about. In fact, um, I may be fired, but I think the provost, this is one of the things that is important for us to talk about. Let me go back to my childhood for a second and place it in that context. So when I was born, my parents were sharecroppers, and the way that we were treated, the things that were said to us, basically because, and obviously I'm looking at this decades later because people thought that, I think some people actually thought we weren't human, but I also think that people thought there was no way that we could ever do anything to impact our lives. So in many ways they were showing their true selves, right? Saying these people, we can do whatever we want to, nobody's gonna care or say anything. And so I learned early on what it was like to feel not seen, to not be valued for something that's totally out of your control. Uh, And for something that's totally not true, right, Uh, in the larger scheme of things. So if you bring that to tenure, I know you're thinking, what in the world does that have to do with tenure? So so if you think of the – what? let's walk back and say tenure is really, really about to protect the research that you do. I know that people think of it that it is actually – Uh, job security. It's not, I mean, I think in some ways it has turned into that, um, which is a conversation I like to have with the legislators, but that's another thing altogether. Um, So that's what it's supposed to do. It's turned away from that. But let me talk about tenure in another way. What's happened, the funding model has changed a lot. So that's why over the last, it may be more than a couple of decades, but it's really, really uh, you can see it now. There's a lot more fixed-term faculty members than there are tenure system. A lot of that is a financial decision, right? Because if tenure, when if you think about it in the concept, and you can understand why people think of it as job security, because there's a lot of things that you'd have to go to to m- remove someone's tenure. And where is it sh- is attached to the research, it gets seen as job security. Whereas with the fixed-term faculty member, you could just say goodbye. You know, it's a way to balance the budget, so to speak. And I know that's a harsh way to say, but if you think about that, that's just a tiny part of it, you know, being layered and complex. So you have a situation now where many of our fixed-term faculty, like you said, there's many, many different groups. So right now, let's just talk about the fixed-term faculty who have earned a PhD. So the fixed-term faculty who've earned a PhD could have a very very different experience from folks who who are tenure system, uh, fixed term aren't tenure system. So I argue that 20 years ago, the folks with a PhD who are now fixed term would be tenured, but the model has changed. So essentially, these are the same people. Um, I don't think people realize it's the same skill set, it's the same education, it's just a different place in history. And so thinking about Michigan State as a land grant, as all about making a difference for, so we're all lucky that we're here in this system, right? But it's our responsibility to provide knowledge and information for those aren't, that aren't here, to send that out. So if you think about land grant, equal, equal equal opportunity, then Michigan State can lead by showing that this model of hierarchy, which we know how it was created, that we can flatten that out. We can make it go away. Because there's a lot of things. It creates the feelings of second-class citizenship. It creates distinctions that aren't real. And so it creates an environment where there is less willingness to compromise because if you're taking advantage of me, we do exactly the same thing, you know, all things considered. And yet my salary is probably higher. I have benefits that you don't. Um, And we don't have to do that. Now, when I say we don't have to do that, we all know that the reason change 
things change slowly. Sometimes it's because the status quo benefits a lot of people, right? Um, again, layered and complex doesn't mean that people are evil people, doesn't mean that it's malicious, but we can change that. Uh, and I, I think it's our responsibility to change that. And so those are some of the differences that you get. And there are so many categories, so many things going on. But I think if we can get that right, and we can, and we have the ability to do so, because otherwise our walk and our talk is not really lining up, right? We say that we're land grant. We say that we want everybody to be you know, equal opportunity. We want to take care of people. You know, people, I, I, the other thing is, too, I think people don't realize just how hard everybody works, right? Um, for the most part. Uh, and any position in the university and anything, really, every time I walk into a Walmart and I see someone my age or older standing there greeting, you know, we have assumptions about people that just aren't right. And it's like, well, because of the way our country was developed, they must not have worked hard enough to do whatever. And that is rarely the case. Time and, time and chance happens to us all. And I think those of us who are fortunate, who are, we, we have a great responsibility there. So if I'm fired, um, you guys will know why. <laughs> No, I, I, I think that's, that's highly, highly unlikely. One of the things that really uh, reached out to me with, with that, that set of comments was um, the, the nature of how the various kinds of positions within the university work together. And uh, uh, one of my earliest jobs at Michigan State several decades ago was in the College of Human Medicine, which I think was a one of the early environments where that uh, uh, connectivity and collective action across uh, the, the tenure system faculty, the health professions, the fixed term, all worked very seamlessly together, where everybody was in the same room making decisions collectively. And partly that's the nature of that environment in that college. But, uh, uh, but for, for me, it was a great place to grow up in the university because of that environment. And uh, so I want to switch gears slightly to another part of the work that you do, because I think as we think about the uh, staff and faculty success uh, component of our strategic plan, there are... Uh, various components uh, or objectives w within that theme area uh, that, uh, th that your office, uh, sometimes very directly, sometimes in a, in a support role, uh, helps, helps tackle. Um, as we think about uh, growing the next uh, generation of university leaders, you know, people like yourself, you get a PhD, you know, in, in this sort of uh, you know, some folks follow traditional paths, other folks follow untraditional paths, but, uh, uh, but, but, but faculty members become department chairs, become deans, become uh, provosts, and, uh, uh, and, and you've hold, held most of those positions. How do you think about what we do in 2024 to support that person that uh, is in sort of wearing the shoes that you wore several decades ago as a newly minted uh, PhD student and, uh, and is taking on their first job as a tenure stream faculty member, maybe with the ambition to play a leadership role at some point later in, in that person's career. What are the things that the FASA office is doing to support that career development mentorship growth of our faculty? Yeah, that is a loaded question. Uh, very, very important. I think, I shouldn't say I think, if I, I think it's important from day one to help absolutely understand, help everyone to understand the holistic picture, right? So first of all, you've got to understand the relationships, like how the budget impacts all of these sorts of things. Um, that is so important because some of the issues that we have 
are people just not understanding how the process works. The second thing that, that I think is something that I see elements of in the current president, um, I think we, and let me say me, instead of like placing this in someone else, we don't do a great job of helping people to understand just how important each job is. So if we go back to like, so say I was at a, a department chair and I'm thinking about um, who, how we are gonna strengthen the bench of folks who would be good administrators. So already you've got that little tension between fixed term and um, tenure system maybe. So if you could help everybody to understand that those jobs are different, but they're both equally important. So for example, um, tenure system usually teaches two, whereas fixed term may teach four, depending on the unit. The tenure system couldn't teach the two if the fixed term didn't teach the four. But in some ways, there's an idea that the tenure system faculty member is more important. Now, that probably, if you get right down to it, maybe uh, has to do with they are developing new knowledge. But if you think about a department like advertising and public relations, where you've got 16, 1,700 undergrad students, those kids, most of them at that point, they want their first job. And it's the fixed term faculty members who had their feet in both places who was really there for them. And so both of those are critically, critically important. And we've got to do a better job of helping people to see that all of these positions are important. And one way to do that, I mean, again, a part of it is the layer of complexity is to reward them. Whereas if you think about, this has been going on for decades, STEM, there's a lot of money there. It's incredibly important to keep the country or whatever. But the humanities are also important. Now, people typically don't understand that the reason that there are foundation chairs for folks in STEM is because there's money there. But can't we as a university, I don't know what the balance would be, but we've got to reward honor and show that the other areas are important, right? When I was a new faculty member, um, I taught advertising class um, and Comart Sci and on Wilson was one of those. And I would always, this is probably not good what I did to the students, but we would all go over to the window and we'd look at the cars that pass by. And so it was really an exercise of helping people to understand just because this person has this top of the line car, it doesn't mean that that person is better than the person who has the clunker, right? Like, for example, the people who, and then I think it was actually individuals were assigned, the custodians were assigned to different building. Think about what it's like if somebody comes into a building that's not clean. That's very, very, very important. Um, you know, even very basic things on the banners that we have. Yes, we've got our Nobel Prize winners, but like somebody that's worked in a dining hall or a, a dorm for 30, 35 years. I mean, that is so important. So again, that's our walk and talk lining up. So if we help people to understand that no matter what service they do, I really am getting back to, you know, digging that, like the bench, making sure that you have a good bench for leadership, that leadership understands the importance of the roles and rewarding those roles, right? So that people can say, well, yeah, I know that's really important, but these are the sorts of things that get awarded. These are the sorts of things where people are acknowledged to, and again, maybe it was never idyllic like this, but if you think about a community where everybody filled the role, right? And what do people... Um, respected what that person brought to the table. And I think, and, and again, I don't know if this is actually true, but um, in, in African-American communities where you could only live a certain place and then everybody had to live there, you couldn't live elsewhere. So people understood what people were going through. So there was just as much respect, for example, for the women who went out to clean houses every day as the physicians and the attorney. And there was always, for whatever reason, a great deal of respect for the funeral home director. Um, but, you know, those sorts of things. So if we can do a better job that that talk that we have about everybody's important, this is a critical role, 
we couldn't do it without. I mean, again, universities, like most things, are hierarchical in nature. So you're fighting the, you know, uh, these different things. But I think to build that bench, you you, you do not want a leader who's not willing to do anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything positive. If you go into a conference room, some group is there, and the support staff is cleaning the tables and taking things away, you need to help with that. Everybody should be, it, it's, it's really important. And so that only happens by modeling, right? And I would be really worried about someone. Obviously, there's a lot of things going on. There may be something that you... Are working on but if that's somebody that thinks that's beneath them or there's just certain things that they don't do that's a problem because leadership to me is all about servant leadership right um otherwise it's not real it doesn't have depth and maybe that's not true across the board but that's been my experience and it's to help people to understand what leadership is well thank you so much for that it's um uh, it's really, I think, uh, to the university's extraordinary benefit to have you in this role. You've, uh, uh, you mentioned Terry Curry, who was, uh, uh, had the role before you. And uh, before Terry was in the role, one of my great mentors, Bob Banks, was in the role. And um, two really extraordinary people that were sort of glue people in the organization, kind of behind the scenes, maybe weren't really ever in the paper, most people didn't know who they were, but um, but did so much to, to to pull the university and keep the university together. And so you've got big shoes to fill, but uh, no doubt uh, you'll you'll be successful in in filling them. We've talked today about uh, the role of the uh, vice provost and associate vice president for faculty and academic staff affairs, uh, a key uh, person. Uh, in the uh, in, in the successful uh, completion of our uh, staff and faculty success uh, pillar of the uh, university strategic plan, you know objectives like uh, workplace culture, uh, creating uh, uh, creating Michigan State as a a desirable place to work and live. Uh, investing in, in leadership and career development opportunities and all of those things that are critically important to Michigan State University. And through the person of Teresa Mastin, we're, uh, we're seeing that work unfold. So Teresa, I want to uh, always, try, always try and end with uh, uh, on an interesting note. And so uh, I, will, uh, I will ask, uh, as, you, uh, as you come into to the office every day, What's the favorite part of your job? What what do you uh, what do you like most? I love that question. Um, so I work mostly with the directors and the assistant um, provost. These are and it's really interesting. They just all happen to be women. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but they're all strong. They all care deeply about the university and their colleges. And my what I like to do is to be able not only to help them do their jobs the best they can, but also to kind of like build that bench, right? Like these people could do absolutely anything, right? So how do we, and again, they're probably some of the most humble people who don't think that, that don't realize that. How do we help them actually shine, right, in that way? Um, but yeah, it's just being there. And I think a part of it is the, the constancy of being there, people seeing you there. Now, what's really challenging right now, I may be at Comartsai, I may be over there, but it's just thinking, what can I do to make sure that this continues, that this story that we're telling, that our walk and talk is lining up and that people understand this and they can practice it too. Well, thank you very much, uh, Russ, and I'll turn it back to you. All right. That was Bill Beekman, our Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, talking with Teresa Maston, our Vice Provost and Associate Vice President for Faculty and Academic Staff Affairs, 
about the MSU 2030 strategic plan and particularly the faculty and staff theme. And there's much more online at simplystrategicplan.msu.edu. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU Today.